and I wrote the book because over the last decade, there has been growing calls for the need to reimagine capitalism. And these calls have come from the corporate side, from political leaders, from intellectual forces as well. There's been a reckoning that the way we have organized the system, while it has lifted millions out of poverty and contributed to strong economic growth, it has also created great inequities in society. The difference between the haves and the have nots for the poorest and the richest is at the greatest level um, in a very, very long time. Now, at the heart of this, is the problem of how we have organized our financial markets and where we have invested our money. Since the 1970s, we have followed a shareholder primacy mantra where our focus has been on short-term profits. And we haven't looked at the environmental impact of the way we have run our businesses and the way we have made our investments. Um, we now know that what we do in business has a strong impact on society and the other way around as well. So the argument for rethinking how to invest isn't an ethical one. It really has to do with creating long-term value for our portfolios, but also for society. Um, there are many that have called out for the need to reimagine capitalism, and there are many commitments that have been made and are being made. We wrote the book because we really wanted to bring attention to how that can be done. Um, in the book, we make the case for how it's something that cannot just be done by the financial industry alone. There is a need to partner with those that are the forefront of addressing some of these challenges, the NGOs, philanthropy, businesses, public agencies as well. Um, so our aim with the book is to really accelerate an interesting and fascinating movement that we believe has the capacity and the potential to reimagine capitalism. So money in itself isn't good or bad. It does what we tell it to do. If we look at sustainable and impact investing, which just a little over a decade ago was a very niche market that was based on trust. It has developed into something that now deals in the trillions. Here in the US, one out of every $3 of professionally managed assets is now in sustainable strategies. That is a huge shift that has happened. We see it across all asset classes and all sectors and really, really taking hold. Um, the other thing that really makes us hopeful this is going to grow way beyond where we are today is two things, actually. One is that for the vast majority of investors that have adopted this strategy, um, it is a value driven imperative as opposed to a values driven agenda. So let's take climate action. Um, the people that are realigning their investment portfolios and their strategies to really address climate change are not doing it because they're on a mission to save the planet. They're doing it because it's good and the right thing to do for the bottom line as well. The second thing I would point to is that the owners of capital, um, the big pockets of those, are the ones that have really taken the leadership in bringing this case about. So it's not a call that's coming from philanthropy or governments, but it's really those that own that money and that capital. So there are a number of things that are happening that really makes us feel that making money moral, as we call it in the book, really is a natural evolution of capitalism and the way we invest our money. One of the main tools of investing responsibly is really the influence that you have as an owner. Your voice matters, your vote matters. Now, divestment, which is a strategy where you sell or choose not to invest in certain businesses or projects because of their profile, um, is an old and well-established strategy. We believe that there is more that can be done if investors actively engage in the conversation and use that voice and use their vote to bring about change. And we've seen it happen in many cases as well. Um, take the example of State Street. It's one of the largest asset managers. They manage more than $3 trillion. They have in recent years had a strong focus on promoting gender diversity in the boards of the companies that they invest in. 
they launched what is called the Fearless Girl campaign back in 2017, where they put out a call and told the companies that they expected them to have at least one female director on their board. Um, fast forward a few years, you now have 700 companies that previously did not have any female representation on the board now have at least one. I mean, that's change that happens when you use your voice and you use your vote. So your voice matters as an investor, your vote matters as an investor, and strategies that can allow you to use both of those to drive towards a sustainable world really is what drives a lot of impact. Impact investing is a term that was coined back in 2007 at a conference that was hosted by the Rockefeller Foundation. Since then, it has really taken root and grown. There are two things that the pandemic really brought to the forefront. One is the interconnectedness between the economy, uh, climate, the natural environment, human health, that if you really look at the implications of that, gives us reason to look at how we have been managing and assessing ESG and bring greater rigor to those areas and depth as well. For example, E, which stands for environmental, we expect that that is going to be broadened to look at much more than greenhouse gas emissions and really have a focus on biodiversity. S, which is the social side of it, we expect that it is going to have a greater focus on social inclusion and human rights. And when it comes to governance, there's going to be greater focus on how the leadership of business businesses and programs that the money is invested in um, manage these sustainability challenges and opportunities and how they govern their organizations. I mean, those are all things that we see as the natural evolution of ESG. The other thing that the pandemic really reminded us of is how frequent the shocks and stresses that we've been facing globally um, actually are becoming and how prolonged they're becoming. And that has brought attention to the concept of resilience. Um, the idea is that, you know, companies need to be organized in a way and governed in a way where they have the ability to quickly adapt and rebound. And those things are not as currently set up measured in the E and the S and the G component. And that's why we make an argument for adding an R to it, an R for resilience. History doesn't go in a straight line. Um, sustainable and impact investing has gone from being a niche market that had a handful of investors to now counting some of the biggest asset owners and asset managers as its champions. And it happened in a relatively small period of time. The big question that came up as we were in the middle of writing this book and the real impact of uh, COVID-19 on the economy and on the lives of people was unfolding was this realization of we finally reached the moment where we'll be able to say what happens with this form of investing when we have turmoil in the markets. I started off my career at McKinsey straight out of business school, and it was an amazing experience. It taught me how to think broadly about the world, about problems. It taught me to go in with an open mind and learn along the way and really push the boundaries of what the possibilities can be. And while I wasn't working in anything that touched the social sector back in those days, that way of thinking and that way of approaching the world is really something that I have held dear since and I've used. Um, and I did it the years that I was at the Rockefeller Foundation as well, and it greatly helped me as I was doing the research and the writing of the book too. <laughs>